Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner, GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. My business partner, Corby McGordon, uh, Ennis Legacy Partners is also with us today. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then for planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that is transferable and then help you exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. If you're a regular listener, uh, you know that we, the Ennis Legacy Partners and, and Walter uh, at GRF CPAs and Advisors, we're, we're agnostic, if you will, as to which exit route an owner chooses. We work to, to help owners decide which exit route is going to most align with their goals and objectives. And that could be an ESOP, it can be a sale to co-owners, sale to management partners, transfer to kids or family members, or, and often, a sale to a third party. And when a third party is the right, sale is the right option, we want to do all we can to prepare an owner for the eventual transaction, including helping them understand and avoid any potential pitfalls that can result in a failed deal. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to, if you again, if you've listened to the podcast in the past, nothing today is going to be new to you, but it's so important that we feel like we need to regularly talk about it and bring it up. And today we have with us a, a special guest, someone that in the industry that we consider a peer, someone we respect. Our topic today is top seven reasons why M&A deals fail. And we're excited to have with us uh, Dan Duran, founder of Quantiv, a financial services firm specializing in M&A advisory, valuation, valuation uh, value creation. Uh, Quantiv is based here in, in the Washington, D.C. area. And they work primarily with entrepreneurs and family businesses in the in the lower mid market. And Dan, who's with us today, had 20 years of experience, investment banking experience, advises directly on select M and A deals at this point, and oversees the firm's uh, valuation practice. He's a certified valuation analyst, among other things. He also, <clears throat> this is one of the things we appreciate about him and. And respect. He he gradu graduated from West Point. Uh, who won the? We got a Navy grad, and we got a and we got a West Point grad. Who won the game? Uh, I, I think it's uh, I think we can skip over this. Blind squirrels do find nuts, you know. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, Dan Duran's with us today, and we're really excited to have him with us. Uh, West Point grad, and he's, he has served as an active duty uh, officer in the um, in the uh, Army. So, Dan, welcome to the uh, podcast. Glad to have you with us. Thanks for having me here, gentlemen. Very, uh, very excited to, uh, to chat through this. Hey, Dan, uh, good seeing you. I'm going to start us off with, I, I think you guys probably have your ear to the ground a little more than we do when it comes to uh, just overall M&A activity. So let me just ask you a question that I think will be of interest to uh, our, our listeners, especially is what are you looking forward to in 2024? Do you think it's going to be an active market or what do you, what are you guys thinking? Well, I think the, uh, what I'm most looking forward to in 2024 is it not being 2023. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So I, I keep talking, every time I, I answer this question, I kind of go back to the the parallel or analog of the great financial crisis and I think what we saw there is about an 18 month window for transaction market to go from, you know, sort of a high point down through the doldrums and get back to some sort of level of normalcy. And for, from my perspective, late 2022 was probably where we really started to see a fall off in deal activity. 23 has been pretty moderated and not what we had seen for the past couple of years. Uh, but what, what we're seeing right now is just a, a higher activity level, you know, more inbound inquiries around sell side opportunities. Um, I think buyers buyers are getting their heads wrapped around the, the debt environment, the interest rate environment right now. Um, so I'm hopeful that 24 gets back to a world of normalcy and out of the uh, sort of standstill that 23 has been. 
Yeah. And it is interesting that, you know, you, I'm sure you get these unsolicited things too, but I mean, it seems like no matter the overall market conditions, people will buy a cash generating profitable business. I mean, people are looking for that all the time. Don't you agree? For sure. Uh, you know, the, the way that I usually talk about this is if we just bucket companies into A, B, and C list companies, A being fantastic rock stars and C being meh, kind of average companies, mm -hmm. what we saw in the last number of years leading up to uh, end of 2022 was basically A's, B's, or C's could sell for a valuation that was maybe not reasonable, like overvalued. Um, when the market starts to turn, A companies always sell. There's always folks out there looking to to grow, to expand, to deploy capital. And if you're an A-list company, you're going to transact probably at a really good valuation multiple. Um, the problem is when you're a B or C. So in the current environment, if you are a mediocre company and not distancing yourself from peers, it's a really tough transaction market without, you know, sort of a fire sale environment. Uh, but to your point, for sure, you know, if you're an A-lister, you're likely to transact at a multiple that's that's reasonable or better. Yeah. And I guess as we're going to be talking about, you know, the um, the seven reasons M&A deals fall apart, I guess in the environment that we're currently in and we've been in for a while, any negative is amplified. So it's like if if people are desperate to buy a company, they're, you know, it's like you fall in love with a house. You tend to, yeah, the deck's kind of falling off the back, but it's not that bad, you know, whereas if the real estate market's, you know, if there's lots of uh, sellers out there, you're like, you know, I, I don't like the color of your, I don't like the color of your dining room. So I'm knocking $2,000 right. off. Yeah. I mean, for, for sure. If you think about, you know, how people make investment decisions in a up market where, you know, there is no apparent downside risk, everything is going the right direction. Cash is cheap. You know, interest rate environment is really low. There's a lot of margin for error on making a bad bet versus, you know, the opposite side of this, you know, where we currently are at, you know, 10% plus interest on, you know, on senior debt or whatever, you know, somebody's paying right now. Um, I'm going to be much more circumspect and probably take a much closer look at that debt, um, that deck that's falling off the house. And every problem in diligence is going to be amplified. You know, it's like pulling yeah. that, that thread on the sweater that, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of it before getting to a yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Hey, hey, Dan, you wrote an article on these top seven reasons and, and you allude to, you know, some of the classic value drivers, given that a lot of our listeners are business owners. Um, talk to, you know, the guy that's sitting out there, they're maybe a boomer or just trailing boomer, and they're thinking, okay, am I going to be an A-lister? You know, you, you touch on a handful of key things. So, but just what's most critical for them? Yeah, if, if we're thinking about, positioning to go to market and what's going to segment me away from my peers. A um, handful of things in no, no particular order. One is outperforming your competitors. Mm -hmm. So if you're you know, a trucking company, a manufacturing company, what have you, if you think about what are the key metrics that are driving that that business, you know, are your revenues growing at a faster rate than average? Mm -hmm. Are your gross margins better, et cetera, et cetera. So like you segment away from peers. Um, Secondly, customer concentration issues. You know, if you have 30 or more percent, 25 or more percent of revenue is concentrated in one account, that's definitely going to be a red flag. Uh, thin management staff, uh, which is often, you know, sort of teams up with uh, owner dependence where, you know, sort of the entire business runs through an owner or a founder. Um, no sales staff, no scalable sales process. There, I mean, there, there's a litany of these things. Yeah, yeah. You go through each one of those and say, you know, if, if this bad thing has happened, I'm much less likely to transact. Flipping that around, that's also sort of your roadmap for if you're that that founder that you reference. These are the things I need to be fixing if I want to transact like an A-lister. Yep, yep. Yeah, you mentioned in one of them is culture as well, that the culture integration tends to be a, a key point. And that's so, that's fuzzy. It's far less measurable. How does an owner know that, you know, one, a buyer's a fit, two, that their culture is, is adoptable? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I mean, I, I think we could spend probably a couple sessions talking about <laughs> just exactly. I know. Uh, so, so let's think about maybe two different points of view here as a sell side investment banker, or even maybe the seller in a company, 
if you are selling the entire asset and walking away, cash at close and putting a bow on it, maybe we don't care so much about how culture integrates mm -hmm. because we're handing the keys across the desk. And oftentimes this becomes a buyer problem and the failure of the transaction happens post-closing. You know, they don't realize the synergies or benefits out of the deal that they thought they would. Yep. Um, but, you know, if, you know, if you're a seller that is going to roll some equity or, you know, keep some skin in the game, um, really cares about maintaining culture post-closing, even if you are walking away, you know, the, the more that you have built, built something that is a special snowflake, the harder it is to integrate into another company. And yeah, that, that's fuzzy, but yeah. you know, it sort of is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. In regard to the management, you know, it, 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 we're on this topic of integration because I, I know management culture, of course, but management being a, a, a key piece of the culture as they're leading it, hopefully, uh, you know, as we're preparing businesses, helping owners to to prepare over years so that you <laughs> would have a, a great product to take to market. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, we're, we're always talking about building a management team, building a management team and it, it, the owner becoming less central. And of course, that that can derail uh, an M&A deal. But the integration of management, that that is another um, challenge that can derail sure. a deal, right? You want to talk a little bit about that, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think some element of this, uh, if you consider the, the size difference between buyer and seller, um, it starts to answer some of this. So if you are a small entrepreneurial type company that is still, you know, sort of fast growth and highly innovative, and you are selling to big co that is slow growth, very corporate, very methodical, mm -hmm. that culture clash can be very acute. And, you know, we've done a couple of deals over the past few years where we have sold a, you know, a sub $25 million company to a $10 billion plus company. And that is a, a really tough road. You know, the, the, mindset of being, you know, the, the second in command of that small company going over to, you know, a fortune 50 company, those are very, very different roles. And I think buyers are circumspect about that. And, you know, especially, you know, at, at a fortune 50 company, they're generally experienced players. They are sort of weighing and measuring that management team and trying to understand, can they still convey value if this thing breaks, the management team breaks. Um, very different, of course, than if it's a private equity company that's, you know, building a platform, they are looking for management to stay and retain them, then, you know, it's not so much a cultural issue as do we have alignment on core values? You know, do we, you know, see the world in the same way? Are we driving towards the same thing? Um, so so we like looking at it through the lens of, you know, different type of buyer, different size buyer, how that, you know, the analysis has to work, um, you know, sort of yields different results. You know, there's not one uh cookie cutter approach to this maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right follow-up question to that so in that scenario that you just shared with us the 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 big company the big co yep it's not their first acquisition acquisition so they've done this before so they understand those dynamics and the challenges of that integration of management in that case they they want to do due diligence to 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 make sure that it's as smooth as possible. But at the end of the day, how much do they care if they're really more interested in other assets of the business? Because yeah. the big co has management already, yeah. and so does that play into it? Oh, for one hundred percent. So if you're big co buying very small co. There has to be a very baked in thesis as to why I would even bother, right? A Fortune 50 company buying $25 million of revenue, that does, that's not even a, you know, a rounding error. So there has to be something in that deal that is attractive for them to even spend cycles on this. And oftentimes that's either technology, defensive, you know, defensible market niche, um, you know, access to particular contracts, there's got to be something in there that is valuable, or even it can be, uh, you know, uh, we did a deal that was a data science deal a few years ago, and just like world class staff of data scientists, that it was, you know, you think of it as like a aqua hire, uh, acquire hire, however you want to say that. Um, so I'm buying data scientists, 
and I just have to buy the company in order to get access to those data scientists. Um, but big code buying small code, it's less for middle management. Like I can find middle managers anywhere. Like I, I've got oodles of recruiters that can go out and find me a middle manager. It's the special sauce that we're trying to buy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I... and then... Go ahead, Courtney, sorry. No, go ahead, Dan. Well, I, I was just going to say from like a banker's perspective, or even a founder's perspective, those can be like the most home run deals. Uh, because again, with the, the concept of rounding error, we think it can certainly well overpay for those small deals, mm -hmm. but it truly has to be like a special unicorn to, to make that work. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, small co is, is likely selling to either another small co or mid-sized company and not sort of skipping all the way up the value chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, as exit planners, one of the, one of the first questions we ask when we start engaging people is just, to, to whom do you want to transfer the business? And, you know, third party is always an option. But what, you know, what I hear you saying is even even what kind of third party, it, it's very significant, you know, in terms of getting clear your strategy versus management team, you know, and, you know. Well, you... And, and these, these discussions and decisions are, you know, super linear. Mm -hmm. um, as a founder, I may want to sell to Big Co, but that doesn't mean that Big Co, any Big Co wants me. <laughs> right? like, so there, there's this like confluence of my hopes and dreams as a exiting founder and reality. Um, in the best case scenario, you know, somebody sitting in your shoes is helping them make a match. And, you know, may, maybe Big Co is just off the table, right? It's just never going to be a possibility. Maybe private equity is off the table. Maybe you're just never going to be big enough to be a platform in a private equity uh, transaction in a period of time that is reasonable to you. So, you know, I, I suspect that you're working with a founder to look at a range of options and build a box around, you know, what is reasonable and attainable in a period of time that is acceptable, and then move everything that is not inside of that, that strike zone off the table and take the distraction away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> let me make sure we're on track here. Seven, seven, uh, top seven reasons why m and deals fail. We've talked about insufficient management capacity. Anything else to say about that, that we haven't said about that one, Dan? Well, well actually, yes, but from a different perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the theme throughout this article is not why deals fail to get to a closing. It's why they fail after closing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the management capacity issue is for buyers that are not experienced. So experienced buyers have a corporate development team or they you know, have an a outside investment banking relationship that is developing deal flow, developing you know, target criteria, working through integration plans, you know, the, whole, the whole kit and the boodle. What we see as a big failure point is a company that wants to acquire has not articulated a great thesis around it, has not built out a team to do this. So it's an additional duty for senior leadership, and they just don't have the bandwidth to do it successfully. Mm -hmm. And it makes it hard for, for a sell side investment banker, makes it hard, it hard to get through closing because this is an afterthought to running your core business. And then post closing, you know, sort of items you know, two through seven on this list are indicative of management not having their eye on integration, culture, et cetera, et cetera, to get to, you know, sort of a su successful return on investment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Um, you mentioned one of the, your, your last one, which I found fascinating, a, a, a poor or delayed integration process. For sure. Uh, and again, I think that's often overlooked as well and related to what you were saying. Yeah. Well, and, and the irony there is, you know, there's been this uh, series of Harvard Business Review articles going back, you know, 20 years, how most M&A deals fail. And it's because of integration. Like, this is the yarn that I think all of us know. Yet, many acquirers don't focus on the integration until the day after closing versus you know, experienced buyers start to build out an integration plan well in advance of closing so that they're swinging through the pitch on the day of closing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it continues to happen all the time. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 it is a it's a significant project for the acquiring company to <laughs> to integrate, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, from you know the things that are sort of easy, like payroll. We want to get pay people paid on their next payroll cycle and make sure that we're not dropping that ball right out of the gate. Um, you get easy things and then, you know, increasingly harder things, the IT systems, ERP, you know, yada, yada, sales teams, and then the culture stuff that we already alluded to, thinking that you're going to buy a company, and, unless it's going to just live on its own little island and you're not going to integrate it at all, um, and, and successfully, you know, see these two things merge together and blossom into a, a bigger, better flower is, is just a pipe dream, right? It is. I, yeah, I, I was in East Coast GovCon and we acquired a West Coast software company. I, yep. did, I did weekly day trips to Seattle. Oh, I bet that was fun. For, for six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, so, hey, Dan, most of the most of the businesses we work with, uh, as you know, they're they're not quite uh, private equity candidates. So when they're th when they're thinking about selling, it's usually to a third uh, a strategic, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and so and, you know, we, we help them think through pre-sale due diligence and and everything that's going to help them have a successful transaction. But yeah, we we don't focus a lot on integration. <laughs> we bring it up generally, maybe. Right. But uh, it, but one of the things that they need to be thinking about in regard to, and, and we can help them do it, uh, in regard to that third-party sale and whether or not that's the opt, let's say they've got they they've got they can do anything they want. They can sell. They can do any shop. They've got the the EBITDA for that. They've they've got the employee. They got what they need. They've okay. got some uh, insiders. They could sell. They could. They've got options. But they're leaning toward the strategic for for the reasons you do that. One of the one of the uh, factors to put into that equation is unless they can just. Uh, slide the keys across the table. If there's going to be an earn out, if there's going to be stock rolled over, whatever, we need to be thinking about that integration piece and, and helping them to understand that as much as the, as what goes on at the deal table. Yeah, for sure. And, and unfortunately, a lot of this depends on the specific buyer and is the ultimate responsibility of the buyer. So there's only so much that can be done, especially on the culture side uh, of things pre-closing um but but way back in your your lane um uh, in, in the work that you guys do is probably either sell side quality of earnings or something along those lines where you know you are positioning you know the financial posture of the company so that those keys can be checked across the desk as easily as possible mm -hmm. and then you know are we actually delivering on that level of earnings post-closing uh, becomes a much easier question to answer at, back to your point on earnouts and, and those sorts of things uh, yeah, it's a uh, th th this industry that we are in is mostly geared towards everything that happens until the point of sale, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, folks like me, fo I think folks like you probably get to that closing table and you know chuck deuces, wish everybody best of luck, have a lovely closing dinner, mm -hmm. and hope for the best because we're no longer involved in that mm -hmm. you know the, the thing that has been built here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned in passing in one of your comments just that you know there's there's the want there's the want and then there's the reality and you know again one of the key points you make is is valuation and the need for an accurate understanding of that and, you know speak to that both from the owner's perspective as well as from a potential acquirer's perspective yeah well uh, gosh this is another one we could spend hours talking through uh, especially war stories right. Um, <laughs> So there's a there's a difference in perceived risk between buyers and sellers. And you know, like that technical definition of value is, you know, risk adjusted cash flow into, you know, into the future. Um, risk being the the key piece and my viewpoint of risk as a seller who's operated an asset for a long time versus a buyer. Mm -hmm. Um sellers always overvalue the asset. Buyers always, you know, tend to be conservative on things. Um so to get to you know, a successful transaction, like figure out where the strike zone actually is. 
working through valuation early and getting a realistic viewpoint on what this asset looks like to me is always like step one ish in working through an eventual transition. So what, what is it like now? How much time do I have to, to work through this process? You know, are you giving me, you know, three months or three years or, you know, 15 years to get from here to your goal. And then we can build that box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're saying just because Walter sold a company for five X doesn't mean I can do that. <laughs> the, uh, the country club valuation, as we call it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, you know, it's, um, we, we were recently involved in a discussion uh, with a not client that is trying to transact and their, their financial records allegedly are a disaster. We've never even seen them because it feels like they don't exist. Um, the seller has an expectation that, you know, they have revenues. So of course they are saleable and somebody should buy this really quickly. And my point of view is that, you know, from the outside looking in 30,000 foot, like, deal screening level. Okay, you're $19 million in revenue or you know, whatever the numbers, I don't even know. Uh, okay, passes my first screen. Step number two is let's look at financials. So, you know, th this mismatch of ideas of, of course, somebody's going to want this. Look at all my revenues versus the reality of, well, it, it can't be a shoebox of receipts, right? Like there's an expectation that we're not just delivering the, the cash flow producing asset, but the infrastructure that you know goes around mm. you know, quality financial statements that you know ha have veracity to them. So mm -hmm. it's a it's an ongoing ongoing struggle. Yeah, and, and you know, as you as you talk about that, you said you know I think that's well phrased. You're passing on the infrastructure that enables, but that's not the what's on somebody's mind day to day as an owner, right? Are there are there management rhythms or practices that an owner can kind of put in place just to ensure that over time they're paying attention to that? Yeah. Well, first I would I would say that if you're a founder that is not focused on this stuff, that you are probably better in a different role. You know, it may, maybe your role is owner operator mm. and not, you know, not founder that is pursuing a third party transaction or any of these transactions that you guys are talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh but, in, but back to your specific question, you know, tools and rhythms to put in place, um, it's probably, Corby, your day job, you know, working on these things, right? It is develop, you know, develop quality reporting, you know, develop a monthly reporting package, develop KPIs that matter to your business that are both, you know, past looking and future looking, you know, predictive in nature. Uh, you know, we like to see that rhythm of every month we are producing a sort of a board level reporting package that is, you know, financial statements, you know, tracking, tracking to or variance from budget, um, reevaluating forecast, are we hitting forecast numbers, looking at annual operating plan, did, did we hit objectives from the annual operating plan or not, what do we have to recalibrate, you know, if we think about how we will report out to a board of directors, there's no reason that a company can't be doing that internally, and using that as the sort of the North Star to drive performance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, fantastic. So Dan, what you know, one thing that obviously could go wrong is the buyer could, you know, just pay too much. But in that situation, I mean, assuming there haven't been any misrepresentations or anything, I mean, that's just kind of a fact of life, right? Uh, well, yes, it is. So our goal as a sell side inv investment banker is to get somebody to pay too much. You know, right. pl plain and simple, that's what we're hired to do. Uh, do I like do, do I cry in my coffee over here because of that? Absolutely not. My job is to deliver the best you know best value on a transaction we can. Um, where that goes wrong is if the seller still has you know, skin in the game going forward, and you know they're they're undervalued on either the rolled equity, they're not going to hit earnout numbers, et cetera. Um, but yeah, like from a buyer's perspective, this this is why they should be doing diligence and modeling and all of the hard work and maybe not looking at this as a part-time job, but mm -hmm. putting in the cycles and the, you know, the budget to get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't imagine the, mm -hmm. the stress on the culture and everything when you got, if the guy, if the seller is still there in some capacity, 
you know, he's coming to the office. Everyone's looking at him like, here's the guy that we way overpaid for this business. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we have been involved in, particularly in our evaluation work, um, with working with uh, lenders, with, with senior secured lenders, where we are doing valuation work in support of transactions that have kind of cratered after the fact. So mm. something did not come to fruition. Cash flow has cratered and we're trying to figure out like fire sale scenarios um, and get bank underwriting comfortable with, you know, what their options are. And those are never joyful interactions and discussions. Um, as, as you can imagine, buyer, seller, lenders, nobody is, is in a really peachy mood. Um, and, you know, so, and some of those things are just, you know, external factors. One of the, the things in this, this article, you know, things that are out of your control. Um, sometimes that is what drives things off the rails, but it's not always the case. Yep. Yep. All right. So we have a few minutes left. We, we've hit on, uh, of the seven, we absolutely hit on management. We hit on culture, valuation, uh, overpayment external factors, poor, delayed integration process. What about, did we hit on- uh, Key strategy. Uh, what? Key strategy is the one I think- Yeah, key strategy, right. That's the only one we haven't hit. Let's, let's so, talk about that. So from a buyer's perspective, if there is not a articulated thesis for why they're doing a transaction and this transaction, to me, it gives me you know, sort of pause for concern that this is not going to go well. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the outcomes of that are, you know, on one end of the spectrum, sometime past closing, you know, we have a, a failed transaction or more near and dear to my heart, we don't get to closing because they're not, you know, focused on something. Uh, bringing that back around to the sell, seller side, the founder side, exiting founder. Um, as a banker, I always want, in, that, in the screening process we go to, I want to hear what that, that strategy is. You know, articulate to me why this is the right company for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, would, I would encourage sellers to, you know, as they're going through management interviews or, you know, sort of that, uh, the, the, the dog and pony show that, that founders go through as they're trying to sell in the auction process, challenge buyers on mm-hmm. why we're even sitting at this table. You know, what is it that's interesting here? At, swing through the pitch. How is this going to look post-closing? And do I really buy into that? Because... Mm-hmm. It is one thing to get to an LOI, but surety of close is really what we are focused on, you know, is maybe point number two um, to get to a closing. And that, you know, the the key strategy and the ability to articulate that is, is just central to it. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I had that thought as we've been talking, you know, your your article is written toward the the acquirer, but what I just heard you say is those same principles, you know, the seller almost ought to interview and, and draw those things out of, of the buyer, right? To uh, particularly- uh, Yeah, I mean, if we have a competitive auction environment and we're sitting down, you know, we've gone through a call for IOIs, we've shortlisted or da- down selected a group of candidates as potential buyers, we're gonna bring in, you know, X number, five, something to sort of that, that final interview process. You know, we, we we, we as a firm typically call those management interviews. Everybody's got sort of a different name for it. Mm-hmm. The assumption is that, that it's the buyer interviewing the seller. And I would argue that it's just as much the seller interviewing the buyer to get a comfort level of what, you know, the next 90 days and the next, you know, nine years are going to look like. As the banker, I care about shorty of close, like I said. So part of that is, do we really believe that this group is vested enough in this transaction where we can successfully navigate all the hurdles and diligence to get to a closing. And for the founder, it's, you know, that plus probably the culture things. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So Dan, as we wrap up here, and this has been fantastic, uh, any final thoughts or words of wisdom before we do wrap up? Uh, yes. Over-prepare. Yeah, so over-prepare. Okay, it, good. Is, uh, it is yeah. one of my watchwords. And good. if I'm, Either if I'm a founder or an advisor like yourself, and we're like thinking towards an eventual exit, under preparing is is not the way to do this. Over preparing, growing into that A list company, is the way that you create optionality for yourself. You know, if you want to be able to IPO, sell to private equity, do anything you want, creating optionality is how you do it, and that means over prepare. 
Well, that's a fantastic note to end on. And over preparing takes time. And so one of the things that we try to communicate regularly is you can't get started soon enough in planning for all of this. 100%. Uh, okay, so listeners, a summary of the top the top seven reasons why M and A deals fail uh, post transaction: insufficient management capacity, um, issues with cultural integ integration, lack of diversion from a key strategy, overpayment, uh, incorrect valuation of the target company, oh, uh, external factors, and poor or delayed integration process. And um, please, again, take heed not just to what we've talked about here today and these issues, but also to that last exhortation, over-prepare. Mm -hmm. And again, you can't get started on that soon enough. And as we make the turn here from one year into another, it's a great time to, to get started if you've, if you've yet to get started. And so thank you, Dan. Walter, you wanna close us out? Sure. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great. Um, we've learned a lot, like we always do, and our listeners have too, I'm sure. So thanks thanks for all this. My pleasure. Is there anything um, you'd like to promote today? And how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, sure enough. Uh, shoot me an email, uh, dan at goquantive.com. Website is go, Q-U-A-N-T-I-V-E.com. Um, thanks for the opportunity to chat with everybody. Okay, great. And Listeners, if you need help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Pat and Corby at 301-859-0860. You can reach me at 301-951-9090. And if you benefited from today's episode, please consider liking and sharing it on social media. And as always, thanks for listening. And until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Walter Dial, Pat Ennis, and Corby McGordon signing off.